Hey Gorehounds, Halloween Kills is a damning indictment of the American healthcare system. A privatized nightmare where Big Pharma runs rampant, sucking hard earned dollars out of the working class whilst the poor are left to fend for themselves. Or maybe not, I don't actually know what the fuck the movie's trying to say. There's a few theories and opinions, which are right and which are wrong, I don't really know. But what I can tell you is what the movie's problems are. Everybody's a star. Lack of focus. Underused main characters. The Dr. Sartain twist. Again. Subverted expectations. Now let's get into this shit. Halloween Kills begins straight where Halloween 2018 left off. We find out that Hawkins survived, and we jump to the first of the movie's 1,469 flashbacks to see how Michael was captured at the end of Halloween 1978. Turns out he just rolled over like a dog! <coughs> we then go back to the present day and the movie presents its first problem. Stars. If Halloween 2018 raped and murdered the 1978 movie, then Halloween Kills is the grave robber that digs up the corpse and loots it. Every single bit player from the 1978 movie is dredged up, given a flashback and precious screen time. Here's Lonnie! Hey, it's the nurse! She's still pissed that Michael stole her car 40 years ago? Hey! Why are you zooming in on this guy's badge? OMG! It's Sheriff Brackett! Tommy Doyle? Why are you hanging out with Lonnie? He smashed your pumpkin, bro! Lindsay's here as well? For the love of gore, how many people are in this fucking movie? I'm surprised they didn't bring in the store owner from where Michael stole his mask from. Oh shit, there she is! It's just a classic case of character overload. I mean, you expect a few new people in a sequel to keep things fresh, but you don't dump an entire garbage can of what are essentially extras all over the living room floor. You get raccoons! If you want to get defensive, then yeah, I mean, the basic idea, in theory, is okay. In horror movies, you never really see what happens to these little characters, or how these murders affect the town. So it's new and refreshing to see. The problem is, we had a whole other movie with a whole other set of characters. So we're way more interested in what happens to them. And the new characters just get in the way. So I guess this sort of idea is best left to a side movie. Or a separate project. So now we're 17 minutes into the movie and finally we get to see how Michael survived. The fire brigade were called out and he escapes when a fireman falls through the floor. Michael then has a fight with the heroes of 9-11 and butchers them all. We then bounce back to the bar where word of Michael's fun and games are broadcast on the news and the patrons start to form an angry mob. We then jump to a gay couple who live in Michael's house and then back to the hospital where Laurie is sleeping. Wake up, Laurie Connor! You got a new movie to be in! Oh my god! We have flashbacks to the 1978 movie, flashbacks for shit they made up that happens after the 1978 movie, flashbacks to the 2018 movie, and flashbacks to shit they already shown in this movie. In case you forgot! There's so many flashbacks it gave me an epileptic fit. Not only is it flashing back to different periods of time, it's also jumping around locations a lot. From the bar, to Laurie in a truck, to Michael, to Laurie in hospital, to a random couple. We're teleporting around so much I feel like Seth fucking Brundle. There's so much shit that's going on too, it actually feels longer than it is. I felt for sure the movie pushed past the two hour mark, but it's actually only an hour and 45 minutes. Now the movie's warping time. Everything seems to go on longer than it needs to. I mean, this sequence goes on for six minutes, and really the whole point of the scene is just to establish that they lived near Laurie and were possibly the ones who called out the fire brigade. I mean, I appreciate that the movie is explaining how the fire engines turned up, but does it have to take so long? It's not a bad question, Bert. Just have Michael bust in and fuck shit up already. Michael busts in and fuck shit up. 
killing off some of the new erm um, characters and this causes a stir at the hospital and mob mentality begins to take over from the police. Lori Connor wants to join in too, but the writer and director tell her to stay in bed. In a move that parallels Halloween history, Lori is underused and spends most of the time in a hospital bed. It's tempting to invite more comparison with Halloween 2, because a lot of time is spent at the hospital, but other than Laurie being there for most of the movie, the two scenarios are different enough for me to give it a pass. For starters, Michael doesn't even step foot in the place. They got some whole other crazy shit going on instead. It pretty much ignores the rest of the other established characters too. Hawkins gets more screen time in flashback form than he does in real time. Laurie's granddaughter is only in a handful of scenes. Only Laurie's daughter does anything actually meaningful. She tries to help the escaped mental patient and saves her own daughter. But even with these moments, she doesn't really get more screen time than anyone else. The movie also forgets about the most important character of all. Dr. Sartain's feet! Things reach a boiling point when the other escapee from Smith's Grove gets mistaken for Michael and the lynch mob move in for a kill of their own. They soon realise that fear of Michael has turned them into monsters too. And it only took the disturbing image of a suicide jumper. <laughs> Hawkins then tells Lori that Michael isn't after her and that it was Dr. Sartain that brought him to her house. In my review of Halloween 2018, I mentioned that the Sartain twist came out of nowhere, and that maybe they should have built the character up over a few movies. Well, in Halloween Kills, when Hawkins tells Laurie that Michael wasn't really after her, wouldn't that have been a cool reveal for the audience as well? If only they left the Sartain twist until this movie, then you could cut out the irrelevant shit like the two guys in the Myers house or cut down on some of the hospital stuff and have a few scenes with Sartain instead. Maybe Laurie could have confronted him. Give her something to do for the movie! Laurie's granddaughter finds Michael and her boyfriend gets treated to one of the most brutal kills in the franchise's history. <laughs> Michael goes after her too but she gets saved by mom who takes Michael's mask and lures him into a trap where he receives the biggest beating since Halloween Resurrection's Rotten Tomato score. But you can't keep Michael down, and he turns it around, kills off the rest of the useless cast, and then Laurie's stupid daughter. So let's talk about the ending. Michael usually lurks in the shadows, and you'd never in a million years expect him to be cornered. Honestly, I have mixed feelings about this scene. In my last video, I talked about how Michael's boogeyman element was diminished by having him captured for 40 years. Well, this scene basically brings back that trait. No human could withstand that punishment and live, let alone get back up and slay everybody. It shows that Michael is definitely a supernatural force, but I think this scene went too far and the character now appears more like Jason Voorhees. Also, I noticed throughout the movie, Halloween Kills plays with a lot of what you expect. For example, you think Michael's gonna stalk Laurie at the hospital like in Halloween 2. He doesn't. You think he's in the car's back seat. He isn't. You think Lindsay's gonna die. She doesn't. Little moments like those kept me guessing and interested. And it's just a shame that the story structure is such a mess, because taken on their own, these little twists are pretty good. It's not all savage beatings though, there are more good things about this movie. Michael is a complete beast. At least they named the movie, right? Everybody gets killed. They even kill the pumpkin from the movie's opening credits. The kill count is more like something you'd find in a Friday the 13th movie, as traditionally Halloween movies feature less kills. Michael has a lot of fun too, setting up gruesome displays like when he fills this guy with knives. We've always known he plays around with bodies because we see the results in the first movie, but it's cool to see him actually do it. And at least it killed off a lot of the characters it introduced, and sets up Halloween Ends to be a hopefully purer, simpler movie about Hawkins and Laurie versus Michael. The new main theme is great too, with the choir type sound adding a new twist, and the score overall is pretty excellent. I've not enjoyed a horror score this much for a long time. 
There's a few good jump scares here and there, and like its predecessor, it's a really well shot movie with lots of creative camera angles and framing. Combined with Halloween 2018, it's a genuine attempt to create a coherent overall story or saga for the franchise. And that's gotta count for something, I guess. So, Gorehounds, do we kill the movie? Halloween Kills ultimately fails to capitalize on what Halloween 2018 set up, and is the weaker movie of the two. So for that, I'm gonna kill it! But if all you really want is a ton of kills and gore, and I know there's nothing wrong with that, then you'll probably think it's the best movie in the franchise. 